Welcome to Fear the Old Lore, where we examine the English and Japanese text of games for more insight into their lore. In this episode, we'll examine the Hornscent, the Miko of the Shaman Village, the Newman, Merica, Curses, and Death in general as it pertains to Elden Ring. Let's begin. With the minor Urchi incantation saying the Shaman Village is Queen Merica's home, I had people asking me about it before I'd even completed the DLC. One of the biggest questions about the village is whether Merica was born there, or if it became her home later. As far as the Japanese version of Minor Urchi is concerned, home comes from Kokyo or Hurusato and specifically refers to the place one is born. Naturally, if Merica was born in the Shaman Village and is said to be a Newman, it could imply that the Shaman Village was the home to other Newman as well. Unfortunately, there's not enough information in the DLC to connect any supposed Newman of the Shaman Village to the Newman of the Eternal Cities, but nonetheless, what little we do know about them can still help recontextualize what we know as a whole. The term used for Newman in Japanese is Maribito, which is a little difficult to explain. Although the kanji for it can be literally broken down into rare person, it's meant in the sense that it's rare for visitors to suddenly appear unannounced. It was a custom in classical Japan to offer such visitors food and shelter, even more so on the off chance that their guests were traveling lords who would repay the kindness with material goods, or kami who would bless their hosts with protection from evil spirits. So although Maribito literally means guest or visitor, such visitors are more broadly associated with the divine, and Maribito are often thought of as visitors from afar, meaning visitors from another realm. More specifically, Tokoyo no Kuni, the eternal land where kami and spirits reside. This could tie in to how America is called the Eternal Queen, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. For a long time, I kind of thought of America and the Newman as being analogous to something like Tinkerbell from Peter Pan, and that the land of the Newman was akin to Neverland, a place beyond the night sky whose residents are long lived and seldom born. But now with the added context provided by Shadow of the Erd Tree, the Americas from the Shaman Village, we need to ask ourselves if the Newman are also from the Shaman Village in the Realm of Shadow, or if they're from somewhere even further beyond the lands between. Either way, if Merica's home is the Shaman Village, what does this tell us about her? The Japanese name for the Shaman Village is Miko no Mura, or Miko Village. There isn't a great way to translate Miko into English since they're typically associated with Shinto Shrine Maidens, but in broader contexts, Miko is also used to describe priestesses or holy women who perform non-Christian religious rites. However, rather than using the standard spelling, this variant of Miko uses an obsolete set of kanji to potentially differentiate the maidens of the Miko village from the other Miko and Elden Ring, like the Finger Maidens and Dragon Priestesses. Although the Miko in Miko village uses the character for child instead of the character for woman, and might appear more gender neutral at first, Surprisingly enough, the meaning of the word doesn't change, and the Miko should still be understood as being female. Of course, just because of the name of the village is the Miko village, that doesn't necessarily mean males never lived there, but there is the possibility it could have functioned like a convent for women of some sort. Although there's a significant overlap in meaning between Shaman and Miko, there are certain connotations associated with the term Miko that aren't carried over in Shaman. For example, although Shaman and Miko are both thought to commune with spirits, Miko do so by letting spirits possess their bodies, whereas this isn't guaranteed for a Shaman. Additionally, Miko are required to maintain their spiritual purity while interacting with spirits or Kami, which may play an integral part in understanding their role in Elden Ring, whereas Shamans aren't affiliated with purity at all. According to the Great Jar in Inner Meat's descriptions, the Hornscent would cut up their criminals and stuff them into jars with Miko in the hope that they would be reborn into saints. It was customary for the Hornscent to adorn themselves with caterpillar masks while conducting such rituals to ward off thoughts of impurity, doubt, temptation, and other forms of wickedness, as they may not have wanted to defile the flesh of the Miko through the course of their work. At least, not any more than what they were already doing. There are a number of reasons the Hornscent may have wanted the Miko to remain free of impurity, but before continuing, I'll need to explain a concept that's at the heart of many FromSoft games and a ton of Japanese media called Kegare. Kegare is often translated as filth, defilement, or impurity, and in some ways it's comparable to the idea of ritual purity in Judaism and Christianity. 
Kagare is a kind of physical and metaphysical filth that can stain things to make them become impure and is associated with death, blood, wounds, decomposition, and decay. Kegare can wither the spirit, etymologically speaking, and if someone were to become stained with Kegare and introduce it to a kami, it could have disastrous effects with the kami raining down calamity out of anger and divine retribution. As I said, Kegare has been a staple in the underlying mechanics of FromSoft games for years, and they've expanded upon the idea of Kagare being linked to blood and death by having it be affiliated with curses and defiled blood, though it isn't necessarily guaranteed that someone will become cursed by coming into contact with Kegare. Instead, to take a page out of Soap's book, filth covering the exterior eventually seeps inside, soiling one's very spirit. By having one's spirit soiled with Kegare, they would become more susceptible to emotions like sadness, anger, regret, and resentment, which would prevent someone from being able to rest in peace. These negative emotions effectively become a curse by causing the spirit to become attached to the physical world and they're unable to pass on or return to the Erd Tree. This is why Dung Eater defiling others with the Curse of the Omen is one of the most reviled things in the Lands Between. Because the Hornset and Potentates of Bonnie Village go to such lengths to avoid impurity in conducting their rituals, it might hint that the Miko have something they lack. But before continuing further, there's a discrepancy in the Great Jar's description that I need to address. In English, it says Great Jars are worn by shamans who perform their worship at jails, which can make it sound like it's the shamans of the shaman village doing the deed, but shaman uses a different set of kanji in this context, meaning the miko of the village aren't slicing up and bottling their own, and this isn't necessarily related to the temptation or betrayal in the DLC story trailer. Of course, all of this stuff with the importance of Amiko's purity is pretty circumstantial so far, and there's always the possibility that the horn scent used their flesh merely because it melted well with others once it was finally using and festering. But a number of other factors lead me to believe that the horn scent were indeed impure. While the Crusade insignia hints at it, the Pearl Shield Talisman and the Black Knight armor set confirm the horn scent have tainted blood, though it isn't clear how the horn scent are tainted or impure. As I was saying a moment ago, there's a definite link between impurity and curses, but I don't want to take such information for granted. Instead, I think we can come to a better understanding of the horn scent by examining what we know of the omen. I admit, it might be a bit reductive saying that the horn scent are like the omen, but I don't think it's a coincidence that both groups made fetishes to memorialize horn children who died during childbirth. From what we know of the omen, they're said to have a cursed blood, and the more horns they have, the more curses they can imbue into their attacks, with regal omens using the most, and hornless omens having none at all. Most omen have their horns excised at birth, a process which most children don't survive, and fetishes are crafted to memorialize the dead children in the hope that their curses won't go on to infect others. This should be enough to draw the conclusion that an omen's horns are tied to curses, which is further supported by how the Dung Eater implants Owen horns into the viscera of his victims to defile them and leave their souls cursed forever. And at the risk of beating a dead horse here, I'd like to clarify that the defilement introduced by the Dung Eater is the same kind of Kegare I mentioned earlier. But just because the Omen and Horn Scent both have horns, that doesn't mean they're the same, right? After all, we've got a bunch of horned animals in the Realm of Shadow, don't we? For what it's worth, there are ascetic horn scent curse blades who are locked away in jails for failing to become tutelary deities, and rancorous spirits cling to the sliced off flesh of condemned horn scent. So between this, the horn scent having impure blood, and their overall similarity to the omen, I think it's a pretty safe bet to come to the conclusion that horn scent blood is cursed as well as defiled. It's a little unintuitive, but the horn scent's relation to manflies and blood fiends supports this. Quote. Afflicted Hornscent eventually metamorphosed into a fly-like form. It was believed that the moment the transformation took place, they were relieved from their suffering. When the weak were infected with a dreaded fly sickness, they perished well before the metamorphosis could take hold. Oddly, those who cared for the infected and made certain they were given a proper burial were never afflicted themselves. There's a good chance the Hornscent suffered primarily because of their illness, but the fact that the horn scent who were cared for and specifically given proper burials never went on to afflict others suggests to me that the fly sickness isn't your typical pathogen and seems to be more akin to a curse. 
Blood fly maggots feed on blood, and if afflicted horn scent had blood maggots within them, then it would mean they were consuming their tainted blood. When a horn scent transforms into a man fly, not only is it believed that their suffering comes to an end, but their horns disappear too. Is it because their blood has effectively been cleansed from the blood flies consuming it? It's hard to say. As I was examining items related to the blood fiends, a few things stood out to me. The blood fiend's arm says it was sanctified, as in purified by a blood ritual, and can spray the blood stored within it with strong attacks. If these blood rituals can purify the impurities within blood, and they're related to the Mother of Truth's power, what could that mean for the horn scent or an omen like Moog? As it turns out, there's a good chance that the blood fiends were horn scent. I know this theory sounds like it's coming out of left field, and it can be a bit tiring hearing theories that everyone is everyone else, but I promise I'm not trolling, and this isn't just spaceless speculation. If we turn our attention to the Outer God Heirloom, it depicts what looks like one of the Hornsent's headless tutelary deities, and says, The clan who lost everything in the Great Fires peered upon the corpse of their ancestor, normally an act of sanctity, and saw in its shadow a twisted deity. The clan had suffered such torment that the horrible thing was taken as an object of worship. This seems straightforward enough, it would appear to have nothing to do with the Blood Fiends at first, but the Blood Fiend Hexer's ashes might provide a little more context. Quote, Long ago, a subjugated tribe discovered a twisted deity amongst the ravages of war, and they were transformed into Blood Fiends. The Mother of Truth was their savior. If we take the subjugated tribe who discovered a twisted deity to be the clan who discovered a twisted deity within the corpse of their ancestor, and it would imply the Blood Fiends were originally horn sent and transformed later, which falls in line with the Blood Fiend Hexer Ash's description. The twisted deity you found within the corpse of the Ancestor was the Mother of Truth, and thus the Outer God Heirloom was made out of reference for the Mother of Truth. This aligns with how it raises the Arcane stat, which is used for scaling Blood Flame incantations. Now, if the Blood Fiends were originally horn sent, but they have no horns now, why would that be? Is it because they were purified by the Mother of Truth's rituals of blood? Is this why some horn scent get turned into manflies? Is their blood cleansed of its impurity through consumption of blood? Is the Mother of Truth attracted to cursed blood, and is that why Moog was able to have communion with her? These questions are largely rhetorical, and one thing I've wondered about Moog is whether he was using his cursed blood as fuel for his blood flame incantations, especially since he only came to love the defilements he was born into after he encountered the Mother of Truth and because he's the only horned omen who doesn't use any curse based attacks. It's interesting to me that Curse Blade Hornsent tried to flagellate themselves in their failed attempts to transcend their flesh and become tutelary deities. In many ways, this reminds me of Kaitha's cleansing chapel in the Cathedral of the Deep in Dark Souls 3. For any who may be unfamiliar with that theory or need a refresher, blood was able to contain souls in Dark Souls, and it was believed that by being bled, one would become purified and it would forestall the undead curse and slow the undead from reanimating. It couldn't. Instead, the way to transcend the cycle of life and death was to follow the path of the dragon and let go of one's desires completely, which seems to be mirrored in the way the tutelary deities of the horn sent practiced asceticism to the point they left their egos behind which is why there are no memories or identities lying dormant within their revered spirit ashes. So this makes me wonder, was self-flagellation a necessary step in the process to become a tutelary deity, or is it just a misguided belief, an attempt at a shortcut that was doomed to fail? Whatever the case, it seems the Hornsent were very concerned with curses if they went so far as to lock away their curse blades and wore ritual implements to impede the spread of impurity as they melded the flesh of the condemned with the flesh of Miko. And while I'm not here to try and morally justify the Hornsent's practices, it does leave me questioning why they would go to such lengths ignoring the bodily autonomy of multiple groups just for the chance for their condemned to be reborn as upstanding members of society. We can only guess but I think the answer would be that to the horn scent, the alternative was worse. Part of the reason I went into so much depth about Kigari earlier is that it ties back into putrescence. Quote, All tainted flesh eventually becomes putrescence, and putrescence is what remains of the impure lives kept within the stone coffins. 
In an age long past, death was burned by ghost flame. Even the remains of tainted flesh were given equal treatment in death. Because there are a large number of gravebird golems found throughout Belurat and in near a limb, it leads me to believe that the Hornscent culture revered death words and would have known about the use of ghost flame quite well even though they had burial practices of their own. The ancient Hornscent of the Tower also studied death hexes which are still used by the Inquisitors today, and the Hornscent's braided robe's ability to enhance the effects of both watchful and vengeful spirits shows the Hornscent had more than a passing familiarity with curses, and strove to limit spreading them as much as possible, which may have been why they went to such lengths to ensure their criminals were reborn anew. After all, what's a little body horror to a horn scent if it means sparing someone the fate of becoming putrescence, or the eternal torment of a cursed existence? Despite having tainted blood and dabbling into hexes, it seems the horn scent went out of their way to avoid propagating curses. Just like the white masked war surgeons who killed friend and foe alike, the horn scent performed mercy killings on their compatriots to end their suffering, though it isn't clear whether their suffering was the product of war or natural causes. Likewise, caring for Hornscent who were afflicted with a fly sickness is similar to the way perfumers like Trisha cared for the misbegotten, omen, and all those deemed impure, ensuring that they died peacefully free of pain, a tale akin to the origin of deathbed companions. I think the Miko play a similar role to deathbed companions for the Hornscent and that they're obligated or coerced into taking on the life force of others to grant them a second chance at life. Taking on the life force of others can be seen as vulgar, but according to Fia, it was a sacred act in her homeland, and I think this dichotomy between the sacred and profane is core to understanding the underlying mechanics of many FromSoft games, and pivotal in coming to a deeper understanding of the Hornscent and Elden Ring. While I've discussed at length the affiliations the Hornscent have with impurity and curses through their blood and their horns, I also think it's important to note that horns are sacred artifacts of the horn scent and are symbols of their primacy or their spiritual supremacy. But isn't that a contradiction? If their horns are associated with curses and tainted blood, why would they take so much pride in them? It's because they're simultaneously holy and profane, and coming closer to divinity is more important to the horn scent than potentially falling from grace, especially with their ways to subvert it. The Hornscent revered the Crucible for its power to blend life together and ability to cause various creatures to evolve by increasing their latent spirituality, leading to growing horns of their own. The higher their spirituality, the more tangled their horns become, and since Hornscent have the most tangled horns of all, it reinforces their belief that they are a chosen people. Horns can act as spiritual mediums for the Hornscent, with their ability to allow one to invoke divinity and summon storms within them. However, one aspect of divine invocation that might not carry over as well into English as it does in Japanese is that divine invocation is often performed by Miko to let Kami possess their bodies. Thus, when a Hornscent performs divine invocation, the Horns act as mediums to allow their bodies to be possessed and use as spiritual vessels per the Horn Warrior Ashes and Beast Claw descriptions. The Roar of Regalia surprisingly enough elaborates on the principle saying it's an incantation that's more akin to the divine invocation of the horn scent than it is to dragon communion. Only through desperate battle with the feral wild can one discover a god unique to oneself. Basically, life and death struggles with the feral wild can allow one to become closer to divinity and summon their fallen prey, which is why the tarnished's ability to summon Regalia is closer in nature to divine invocation than dragon communion. If this is the case, it would imply that the horn sense ability to summon divine birds and divine beasts would be because they slew them in battle. The kind of life and death struggle at the heart of divine invocation reminds me of what's described in the Brant Sword Talismans. The heart sings when one draws close to death, and a glorious end awaits those who cling so tenaciously to life, to render up a death worth offering, and from death one obtains power. Likewise. The deadliest horned creatures enjoy the sport of hunting and devouring other horned creatures, and the spirit calculi found in the horned beasts of the ancient ruins of Rao reflect these creatures' higher spiritual power from hunting the deadliest prey. Horns can bring one closer to divinity, and just like the way the regal ancestor spirit's horns can absorb spirits to gain new abilities or restore HP, a horn sense horns can allow them to perform divine invocation and make use of the aspects of the divine beasts and birds they've slain. 
One of the parts of this which interests me the most is that Divine Invocation incantations are classified separately from both Spiral and Crucible incantations, and they don't benefit from either of their bonuses. So even though Divine Invocation is said to bear resemblance to the Golden Crucible, the source of its power is ultimately different. If I were to make a guess as to why, it would be that the Crucible might draw on the innate power of life, whereas Divine Invocation would draw on the power of life obtained through death. Based on the horn charms and the Ancestral Spirit's horn, budding horns bud over and over again with new life coming from death, and only the repeated sprouting of fresh horns can create a tangled horn, which is viewed as an irrefutable symbol of primacy. So while the original horns of the horn scent may have come from the Crucible's blessings, I think it's possible the tangled horns that would go on to define the horn scent could have been cultivated either intentionally or unintentionally through the practice of divine invocation and continually absorbing spirits into themselves. This could explain why the Horned Warriors had the largest horns of all. They're the ones performing Divine Invocation, but that may come at a cost. Communing with the dead can heighten one's spirituality, but with death being Kegare, it would also solely the individual who performed it. If the Horns enter anything like the Omen, who are assailed by spirits due to their accursed blood, then they may have never stood a chance remaining pure Hence why so many of their children die young and need memorial effigies created for their salvation. The ability for Hornsent to perform divine invocation and allow spirits like the divine beast to enter or possess their bodies is awfully similar to the way Miko can act as spiritual vessels for the divine, and with the Hornsent Empyrean Grandam being virtually identical to a finger reader cone, I have unironically wondered if the Miko of the Miko village are just Hornsent without the horns. If that's true, and Miko are meant to be Newman like Merica, would that mean the Horn Scent are Newman as well? Is the ritual purity truly what separates the Miko from the Horn Scent? It seems like there's a good chance this is true, but it's up to you to decide. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with a hypothetical. If the Horn Scent can beckon divine beasts into their bodies despite having impure blood, just what kind of divine beast can be beckoned by somebody who's pure? I find it really interesting that Mariko wished Mesmer to be the figurehead for her cleansing crusade and serve as a scapegoat for the curses or maledictions and ire of the horn scent. It makes me wonder if Mesmer took the role seriously and whether all the statues of Mariko except the one in his chambers were defaced to ensure no one could defile her with their ire. But that's pretty heavy speculation. Anyway, that concludes things for now. Let me know if these connections make sense, and whether or not you think I should go into more or less detail on the Japanese side of things in the future, since it's always difficult trying to determine whether I've included too much information or not enough. Thanks for watching. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and channel members for their continued support in motivating me to keep working on these kinds of projects and keeping the channel alive. Until next time. Fear the old lore.